I'm Josh Underwood, I'm, I'm a visiting researcher now at the London Knowledge Lab as part of the Institute of Education in, in London and I'm teaching also part time at the British Council in Luba. And if I wasn't here now, I'd be trying to um, grab and hold the attention of 14, 14 or 15 year olds until about 8.30. So <coughs> I'm not really sure which is more of a challenge, Sorry, trying to <laughs> maintain your engagement or do that. But anyway, I should also clarify, seeing as it's been video, I'm speaking in a kind of personal capacity, I'm not representing either of these organisations and the comments I make are all my own, etc, etc. Um, okay, so I didn't, the other thing, yeah, I didn't realise I was going to be speaking at this time and not after so many interesting picture pictures, but what I'm going to do is um, give you a very quick overview of who I am, some ideas that I find interesting and important about learning vocabulary. Uh, I, 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 I don't like that, but keep me moving, I'll stay awake. Um, and things that I think are interesting developments in current mobile assisted language learning, particularly referring to vocabulary learning. Um, UX design, by which I mean experience design. So my background, I should clarify, I used to be a teacher 20 years ago, an English language teacher, but actually my academic background is in user interface design, HCI, kind of edge of computer science and psychology. So I would do user experience design, interface design as my, as my background. Um, and I want to conclude, as was suggested, I think, by Tim, by making a few connections across vocabulary, mobile assisted language learning, user experience design, um, to suggest some opportunities and challenges for mobile assisted language learning. Okay, so your task is, before I get to the final slide, when I say my seven challenges and opportunities, make your own connections and guess what I'm going to suggest the challenges and opportunities are, okay? And the other thing I'd ask you to do is, the same as I, you know, I get this anyway without asking from my students, if I'm boring you, go like this. And if I'm speaking too quiet, go like this. And if you want me to go faster, you know, so use a, a bit of, I don't, I don't want to take questions because I've got so much to say and we'll be here until nine o'clock. I'll take questions at the end and I'll talk more about my own stuff at the end. But um, do use your gestures and faces to tell me what you think. I'll try and move faster or so. So, before I say who I am, describe who I am, um, who are you? Uh, who considers themselves to be a teacher, first and foremost? Okay. Uh, researcher? Uh -huh. uh, technologist? <laughs> right, a few. Um, designer? Oh, okay, so, so most of us are coming from the same kind of place as I'm coming from. I consider myself first and foremost a designer, in fact, and I've already said that's my background in a sense. I'm a designer and a researcher. I do research through design, design-based research, if you like. Um, but I'm also a teacher, you know, you know, through circumstance, was an English language teacher, and I'm back in the classroom as of six months ago, experiencing what it's like to be under pressure, time constraints, etc. in the real classroom. Because I think that's important because you forget it when you're just doing teacher training and research and design, which is what I have been doing. Um, and of course I'm also a learner. You know, I speak Spanish to some extent, I speak French really poorly despite learning French all the way through school, <coughs> but I, I quite like trying to pick up a bit of French. And I speak um, Muscada terribly badly. But, so I, I, I'm kind of a beginner and a false beginner and reasonably advanced, so I have some. So I draw on all of these experiences in my design work, in my designing learning experiences, if you like. Um, and recently, last year, we, I was a co-editor of the Handbook of Design and Educational Technology by Rutledge. Rather expensive, but I think a lot of the authors have um, self-archived their papers, so if you see things that you're interested in, Google for them. Okay? Um, particularly design-based research, Peter Ryman's chapters, perhaps useful to look at on that. So, to explain a little bit more about who I am, I'm going to say a bit about a couple of projects that I've been involved in um, 
when I was working for the University of Sussex and the Institute of Education in a more formal capacity. And all of these, I should say as well, were supervised by Professor Rose Luckin, who's been a very big influence on my thinking, obviously. So um, there's three projects I want to talk about. Participatory science, homework, and my lexicon. My lexicon is my PhD research, and I'll kind of leave that a bit to the end, because Tim also said, don't say too much about your own stuff, because um, probably people won't you know, be able to generalize it to other circumstances. But the participatory science projects and the homework projects particularly influence my thinking, so I'll say a little bit about those. Um, so, first of all, homework. Well, this was back in 2003 to 2006, reported in BBC News in 2006. So I'm going to show a very little video clip. Now, it's, it's low resolution, so you're going to see it this size, but you should be able to hear it as long as I've got the volume up on my computer. Um, so this was back then with the very first tablet PCs. Do you remember those? About this thick, <laughs> Bef way before the first iPads. But they did have cameras built in, so you could do video and take photos and stuff, which was important. Um, I've called it, what did you get up to today? Because you can't really hear the beginning of the audio. She says, what did you get up to today? Can you guess what the kids say? Okay, well, my kids always say, I say, what did you get up to at school today? Nothing. 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 So just to give you a feel for that project, this is what the BBC said about it. But now the answer to what twins car and Layla got up to at school is The tablet served as a kind of nexus to better connect the ecology of resources available in the school with the home and out of school resources. So they say, oh, you know, what they did, what did you get up at school? Well, now it's all contained in this bag on the tablet. The tablet was giving the parents information about what they had done at school today, the curriculum objectives to some extent, suggestions about activities that they could help with. The kids were not, you know, it wasn't the same as getting out the course book. What did you do today? Let's have a look at the course book. The kids wanted to use the tablets. There's engaging media on here. So, oh look, we looked at this video together or whatever. So it's like a bit like TV, etc. So the key thing here was mobile technology, not enhancing learning of itself, but serving as a nexus to create better access and better knowledge about what was to be learned, how it could be supported, and connect the learners to 
classroom resources that could help them, but also to out-of-classroom resources <coughs> that could help them. Okay. Um, the second project that I was going to mention was participatory science. This is quite some time ago as well. I mean, we didn't quite remain faithful until about 2008, but it's stretched a series of projects funded by the SRC and the SRC that stretched between 2001 and 2008, mainly with UCL, uh, with Nottingham, Steve Benford and people. Um, basically, we were giving kids small mobile computers and build, that mobile phones weren't capable of doing sort of stuff in the A carbon monoxide sensor and a GPS sensor the size of that thing. And they were making a hypothesis about where pollution would be worse on the campus, where we were at the University of Sussex at the time, and going out and measuring carbon monoxide levels, capturing that data on here. They also were videoing the hypotheses that they were making on the fly as they captured the data. And then the data was mapped to the campus, they could see where the higher and lower levels were, and that was disposed to support reflection in the classroom. And they shared this information with um, environmental scientists who we then brought into the classroom through Skype, etc. So, the key things that I take away from this project was that um, the kids were really engaged with outdoor data, captured mobile devices, were very <coughs> useful for helping them capture data about their environment, some, to some extent supporting reflection and hypothesis making on the fly outside the classroom, and really good for capturing and sharing that data with <coughs> technological tools to turn it into these interactive maps, and with other people that they could talk to about it. But the real challenge for us was making the reflection and analysis and report writing as engaging as the capturing data and talking about it out there. And I think that's common to a lot of people who have had these experiences. So mobile can be really good for data capture, stuff on the fly, in action, but how do you then extend that to more analytical, reflective thinking in a useful way? Okay, so obviously coming from those two projects, I'm looking at using mobile to connect people, to better connect people to resources that can help them across different settings, and particularly interested in using mobile to capture data, inquiry learning, if you like. So I guess it's natural that my work for my thesis and looking at and reflecting on my own language learning with mobile devices evolves around the kind of inquiry-based language learning. Is it possible to learn language through inquiry, through observing, noticing language, capturing it, reflecting on it, and making it your own in some way? Um, so I had an experience where I was driving through the Pyrenees close to um, the Basque country border, and I stopped at a gas station, and I said, you know, I bought a few things in my very bad French, and the guy at the kiosk said, um, Vive le poche? And I, poche? Okay, it's not But anyway, I, I noted it down, and I tweeted it or shared it on my blog or something, and then some friends got in contact me, and I, you must have heard something else, and then a friend from Brittany said, oh, Vivos Pochon, which we sometimes use. But then I found another friend sent me a link to Witchery, which said, sometimes, in the Pyrenees, people use posh to sort of that small plastic bag or sack, whatever you want to call it. Etc. So this was a process of learning vocabulary through inquiry, through observation and inquiry, facilitated by capture on the mobile device and by my personal learning network, social and technological. So that inspired the design for my PhD research in which I built an app that would be easy to capture audio, visual, or textual information about language, share that with whatever resources you use, social resources, so just the app says what can accept this data and finds all the apps that can accept that data, and then you can use them to send it to Twitter, Facebook, whatever you happen to use on your phone. To investigate, you can Incorporate your own resources there. So you, I'll explain this later. I don't want to go on that. But anyway, that is configurable. The user configures which resources they want to look words up in to the ones that they prefer using. So, and that supports reflection. So it prompts you to self rate yourself according to how well you understand something and how well you can use it. And if you click on the info buttons, it gives you prompts about particular aspects of it. Well, do you know how it's spelled? Do you know how it's pronounced, etc. Those are just prompts. What it also does is it keeps a history of every change you make 
and everything you do with that through the app. So it's more like a wiki than your typical vocab. It's like a personal wiki which you can share with other people in your social network, if you like. Anyway, I don't want to go on about that. I'll come back to it if people are interested later. Um, I have a talk related to it at Euracle 2014, so you know, if you want to find it out, you're there. You'll hear about it there. Um, this is my classroom. This is where I should be today. Okay, so you can see that we have a class set of iPads locked up in a cupboard that can be wheeled up around, plans to school, etc. and use. And you know, the kids that I use them with love using them. The teachers are a bit, um, you know, unless you're very kind of tech familiar and confident. But they have used them. In fact, I've left this open on a particular page, which is um, Me Books, Little Red Riding Hood. I'll come back to that later. But that's a particularly successful activity using iPads that I've built around that, around noticing language and trying to use it. Um, I'll come back to it in a second. What, what being back in the classroom really reminds me is that when you're teaching, there are all kinds of practicalities and constraints that really tie you down. It's difficult to do inventive stuff. But it also reminds me that <clears throat> engagement, getting people's attention and holding people's attention is absolutely essential. <coughs> yeah, that's where you need to start. And I think people often forget that when they're designing experiences. And fun. You know, if I ask them to get their mobile phone out and use my app on their mobile phone, my, my app on their mobile phone is competing with WhatsApp, whichever game, Minecraft, you know, whatever their addictions are. So this, my app has got to compete with that kind of engagement unless I oblige them to use it for some reason. Okay, so I'm going to move on to section one of my talk. That was the background. Whoops, I'm using up a lot of time. Um, make it clear if you're bored and if you want me to go faster. How to learn vocabulary, how should we learn vocabulary, and what should the apps that claim to help us learn vocabulary do? Um, there's a couple of things here, a couple of perspectives that I think are quite interesting. Lexicon, I've spoken to the guys that make this. This, the idea is they catch you at the moment you want to find something out. So you're reading, you look it up quickly. The moment you look it up in their app, it's captured to their flashcard system, space repetition, and then so, you know, you're reading, catch it, you get up, oh, I've got the meaning, but then you get a reminder to study, and you have a space recognition, a space repetition out already driving that to test you through it. Okay, so that's there. And others, lots of others, are saying, learn through what you love, incidental learning. Just watch loads of TV in English, or mix, have you seen Flix TV? Where Flix TV? Okay, Flix TV is an app that will let you watch your own videos with subtitles, and it will automatically mix your native language and the target language. The idea being, the same as the ones that are on reading the text, text online, that micro-learning from understanding in context because you have your own target language, but inserting little bits, sorry, your own language, but inserting little bits of target language, you'll have really good understanding and you'll pick up these meanings eventually. Um, those are two ways. I found a good, when I was looking for a good joke, video joke, to keep you engaged, I found something that's not a joke, but it's actually quite interesting. And here's where I have to switch out, so this may go wrong. How should we learn vocabulary? Well, this, this video, whoops. This video suggests, I think probably for native speakers, um, various strategies for learning video. So what I'd like you to do is watch the video and think, how does mobile How to improve this? your vocabulary. If TV cartoons don't provide enough intellectual stimulation, try these tips to improve your vocabulary and impress your friends, or just yourself. You will need books, a dictionary, a notepad, and a computer with internet access. Optional flashcards. Step one. Read everything you can get your hands on with a dictionary at hand for unfamiliar words. Step two, look up a word in the dictionary each day. Once you comprehend usage and correct pronunciation, write it down and memorize it. Step three, listen to conversations and jot unfamiliar words in a notepad. Look the word up and use it in conversation. Flashcards with word definitions are a quick way to practice sounds, pronunciations, and meanings. Step four, write words in a sentence, then read them aloud to retain them. Step five, play word games which build your vocabulary while you're enjoying competition and having fun. Resources for daily word 
challenges and fun vocabulary exercises. Step six, group words and meanings specific to fields of interest or themes. <coughs> Did you know reading 15 minutes a day translates into one million words a year? So my, back to my presentation? Yeah. Okay, I actually think there's some pretty good advice there, and um, mobile phones could make a lot of that a lot easier. So it's, they're not, they're not making, making it possible to do stuff that you couldn't otherwise do, but they can make that experience much, much easier, and potentially more enjoyable and easier to share with others. But um, let's move towards research. What does research say you should do to support that recovery learning? Um, Okay, I've got this slightly in the wrong, wrong way around. There are, there are loads of vocab apps out there. These are a few of the ones that I'm trying out. I don't really know about that one, but we've heard it, but I've been trying it for a few days. Um, there's the British Council one, which keeps evolving, so I can't really say much about that, but it's getting better, I think. Vocab.com, do you know vocab.com? Okay, I, I like the fact it sends me emails from time to time to challenge me, that gets me going, about, you know, do you know the answer to this? And um, that one works with some kind of learning identities, so they look at what other people with looking at similar words have said and send you kind of personalised to your level of work, I guess. Um, let's come on, already mentioned. There's one that's gone from here, which I think is important. Snap Panda, have you ever seen Snap Panda? Snap Panda, I'll demonstrate it on my phone a little later. You can um, point your camera at the book you're reading, tap the word that you're interested in, it uses OCR to recognise it, and then looks it up in a dictionary for you and saves it to your looked up words. There's a whole load of apps. All of them do different stuff well, and some stuff badly. And I think there's a common failing to all of them as well. They don't play together. They don't play well together. They don't play with other apps. It's not easy to get the word that you're looking at or reading in one app into the vocab app, into the flashcard app. It's not easy to support the various activities that are required in a smooth way between all of these apps. And I'll come back to that in a second. So, on to what I was claiming I was going to say before, what should vocab apps do? I think one really important thing is they should respect the fact that vocabulary learning is incremental, cumulative. It's not word plus translation done. It's word plus translation plus experience plus pronunciation. Plus, and it doesn't happen in one go. I've lost the word in English now. But anyway, um, you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's progressive. And it's multidimensional. There's several different aspects of word, knowing what a word is, or knowing what a phrase is, etc. Um, Schmidt and Schmidt, way back in 1995, came up with 11 principles that vocabulary notebooks, paper and pen vocabulary notebooks, should abide to. Read the paper for more detail on what those 11 are, but the ones that I particularly like to pull out were personal stores centred on individual needs, so not a whole load of flashcards of vocab that other people think is useful for me, yeah? driven by my needs, my context, and shared with teachers for help, particularly with prioritisation and vocabulary learning strategy. So, for example, Vocab Notebook seems to hit that one. There's other ones that I don't think it does hit, but um, it hits that one. Uh, what else? Okay, there's another really useful paper, Nakata, 2011. 17 criteria for assessing flashcard apps on PCs, but these are all relevant to mobile apps. Okay, um, now Kata suggests that most of the apps fulfill several of the criteria. Look at the paper if you want to know what the criteria are, but two that they do not fulfill, or very few of them fulfill, are increasing retrieval effort. I don't know whether we need to explain what we mean by that, but scaffolding it. So, for example, if I'm trying to say, you know, what's the word for apple in Basque? And um, you go, oh, I can't remember, and I go, maybe sa. I'm giving you little clues to try and scaffold your. Okay, very few, it's, it's, it's all or nothing or self assessment for most of these vocabularies. Um, and they, none of them, according to Nakata, prompt generative use. Generative use being the flashcard apps usually have a static, it's, you know, do you know this word in this phrase? Generative use would suggest that 
you recognize what it means in this phrase and then you say it in a different phrase the next time in a different phrase and, or you're prompted to use it in a different way. So very few of them do this kind of stuff. Um, another thing to bear in mind is Hasegawa's research suggests that self-creative material, which you would expect, I guess, is much better for longer-term retention. As I was actually talking about little mini video clips or photos to go with vocabulary. Okay, so I think most people believe that vocabulary is better learnt if you invest more processing and if you create your own materials, you're likely to be investing a lot of mental processing. In the, um, the more recent review, Ma suggests that there is very little integration of tools. There are dictionaries for looking stuff up, and there are flashcards for learning stuff, and there's tutoring for deliberately teaching you particular types of vocabulary, but nothing integrates them all, or they don't integrate across them, so there's no integration. Um, and also that there's insufficient tracking of the user's activity, insufficient adaptivity according to what the user has or hasn't done in one app or in various apps. Are we getting bored at this stage? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to the next step. So, I'll drop vocabulary research for a second and move on to some more tech directions. Now, here I'm just looking, just cherry picking a few things that interest me, either as con concepts for mobile apps or as actual functioning prototypes that I've noticed in the literature and recent literature. Um, what's that that I'm more familiar with? So, Situated capture and sharing. There's lots of apps that do stuff very similar to mine. Um, starting with CloudBank, which evolved into Lingo B. They were capturing examples of language in use, people living in the UK, and sharing those, associating images or etc., in a kind of closed community initially. I think they've opened this out in Lingo B, so you can now share it to Twitter or Facebook or whatever. This was kind of simultaneously developed more or less as, as the, my PhD app was. Uh, scroll, or gap is one, I tried that on my phone, kept crashing the phone, so I can't say an awful lot about it, but the user experience was pretty terrible. But that was de developing um, your own learning objects that might be connected to observations of language that could be geotagged as well and made available to other people and used in quizzes, etc. So those are two areas that are quite interested. Um, situated help, so help, to help you communicate in a setting. Um, Express was from the CHI 2013 conference. The idea here is that you're in a setting, you need some kind of vocabulary to help you express what you want, and you crowdsource it from a community on the fly on your mobile device. So this was a prototype tested and evaluated kind of small scale for CHI. Um, Essentially, you know the word reference forums, for example, so you come across something that you can't really translate, but imagine being able to do that on the fly in the, from your mobile in the laundromat. That's, that's the kind of thing that this suggests to me. There's a different approach, Vocab Nomad, Vocab Nomad, reported in the AI Ed 2013 conference. Instead of trying to crowdsource help, this uses corporate and location information to filter out language that might be useful to help you express yourself in that particular setting. So that's kind of similar to micromandarin. Micromandarin, this is also one that was reported in Kai, this was a Microsoft project. So this really is a kind of flashcard style stroke phrase book style app that uses the Foursquare API to detect where you are and tries to present study materials relevant to the setting in which you're in. So this is the kind of backed by encoding specificity theory, I guess. Um, if you study the vocabulary for cafes when you're in the cafe, you're going to remember it better. I, I slightly question this because you know, what we want to be able to do is transfer across settings. But anyway, the idea with micromandarin was to go from the spaced repetition distribution of learning across time to go to spaced setting distribution, support learning across settings. So it's another interesting concept that you might be able to make some connections with. Um, then there's a whole load and a long history of kind of trying to support incidental learning while you're doing other stuff. So in terms of mobile, vocabulary wallpaper has an Android Live wallpaper and it um, shows you word pairs, translation and the word related to the setting that you're in. 
well, well they, they did a controlled experiment, small number, I can't really remember what the results are, but it was suggesting that it was better with setting specific vocabulary presentations. So if you're in that setting, you might pick up this vocabulary better. Um, French kitchen, I'm sure loads of people will see this, is not really incidental, this is deliberate task-based learning. In a kitchen setting, making omelettes, whatever it is, moving the stuff around, it's all got tags in it, you hear the instructions in the target language, I think French in the original ones, as you're moving the stuff, they tell you what you've picked up, etc. So the idea being very similar to the much earlier work by Intil and others, where you walk around the tool of house with sensors, and as you pick up your phone, you hear mobile or whatever it is in the target language. So through acting in the environment and the world, you acquire language. And that's kind of similar to the ideas about web-based um, incidental learning. So, you know, this, I'll try and remember what the reference is, but people who, um, you read the news on a daily basis on your favourite website, and they insert micro-learning opportunities. They automatically translate little bits of what you're reading into the target language. So, it's in the context of what you understand, you pick up bits as you go along. There was a recent one at CHI 2014, Weight learning, they call it. This one, um, open, op, written for a browser, but these days browser, mobile, same thing. That one, you're chatting in something like WhatsApp, and as you're waiting for the reply, it inserts related quizzes about the target language. So you might be chatting in the target language, you might be chatting in your own language, but while you wait, you get some quiz or some language input in your target language. So these, I think, are all interesting possibilities, and I'm just throwing them at you in case they spark off interesting ideas for you. Um, another one, which I wanted to mention because this links to something I'm going to say later on, automated glossing stroke picture notes. These are both from CHI 2014. Automated glossing with picture notes while you um, hover over a word in an electronic text, it looks for related images and shows you those. So the assumption being that if you're hovering over this word, you're trying to struggle with the meaning, and perhaps an image will help you fix the meaning and help fix that in your memory. Um, Transphoner does something quite interesting. It automatically generates um, keyword mnemonics to go with target vocabulary. But there's just a few ideas to find you, and I'll try and tie them up. I'll make my connections. You make your own connections to see whether you can guess where I'm going. Okay, so I'll move on to part three. Seven ways to think about mobile assisted language learning experiences or designing mobile assisted language learning experiences. So, one of the ones that's already been mentioned is time, place, activity. Basically, concepts to frame your thinking about your design work. Um, there's a whole load of these, obviously. So, Several, several of you will have gone to Nikki Hockey's talk. Uh, there's a recording of her IATEFL presentation, which is quite good on the British Council IATEFL website. Um, she talks about thinking about whether it's the mobility of the device, the mobility of the learner, or the mobility of the learning that is significant for your pedagogical design. Whether you're talking about mobile content, mobile tutorials, creating mobile material, um, or communication. I think those are all things that are worth bearing in mind when you're thinking about your design. I'm not going to dwell on any of these or give you examples of them because I don't have time. I want to get to my personal favourite way of framing your user experience or learning experience. Um, ten principles for mobile assisted language learning from Palalas and Mieska Palalas. Uh, so these are drawn from her design based research for her doctoral thesis. She draws out 10 essential princ pedagogic principles for successful mobile language learning. The ones that I particularly wanted to focus on, she claims that learner-generated artefacts are very important. Uh, and that's certainly my experience in the classroom, learner-generated artefacts, really engaging, meaningful for the student. Um, and connecting your design, or sorry, designing your experience so that it connects the classroom learning and the out-of-classroom learning that you want to happen. I'll come back to that in a second to give an example from someone else's work. Um, so, yeah, if you want to know the rest of those principles, look at that paper. Ten more principles, this time derived by Stockwell and Hubbard from their experience of mobile language learning. Um, these are in an open accessible 
paper in TIRF. You can find those, and all the references and the links will be in my slides. Um, the ones that I want to focus on particularly are, okay, so we know that SMS or instant messaging or whatever can be an effective way of kind of prompting space retrieval or supporting vocabulary learning. But they suggest you need to push respectfully. You know, let the learners determine how many messages a week they want to receive, when, etc. This is so kind of negotiation between the learners and the instructors about what an appropriate amount of pushing might be. Um, respect difference. Different people will use stuff in different ways. Different people will choose to interpret your design in different ways. Look at the paper for more information. Sorry. Um, Sharples. 2012 at an open university one. Well, this is useful as well. Are we learning, despite the context, are we trying to learn something completely unrelated to being in a crowded train and closing out the setting that we're in? Are we trying to learn in context? Are we learning to order food in a restaurant while we're in the restaurant, etc.? Are we learning about context? Are we learning you know, miss up, uh, about the stuff around us? Or are we learning through, I would say, creating context? which he suggested a kind of more social cultural uh, perspective where we might be creating context by imagining connections, by um, creating our own world through role play, etc. There might be examples of this. And I think that certainly Sharp has described my project in the creating context area. So I think when you capture a word and share it, you're creating your own context around that. But I'll come to that in my final example. Um, ten dimensions of facilitated seamless learning. This is Wong and people in Singapore find out what the dimensions are there, lots of them, but the most interesting ones for me were between home and school, formal and informal settings, and between experiential knowledge and conceptual knowledge. And they suggest kind of facilitated seamless learning where teachers help learners recognise the opportunities to make connections when they're outside of school, and learn outside of school. So the particular task I was referring to was, I think it was idioms that were taught in school, and then they take the mobile devices out and find opportunities through to take photos that they can relate to those idioms. Then they create their own phrases expressing the meaning of those idioms with those photos, share them back to a wiki, which are then discussed in class again. So this is an example of a design that links in school, out of school, learning, if you like. Um, Time, place, activity, and now I think in the later papers, journeys. Now I think what's important here in the move from time, place, activity, which is useful, is the journey. Think about the time and the place of the learning, but think about how it connects to the other episodes of learning. So learning is not is, is cumulative across episodes. So it's important to think about the journey, or I would say the trajectory. So this looks back to concept from interaction design more than from learning Steve Blanford's group talking about interaction trajectories and by focusing on the trajectory of the experience that you want people to do to have you have to think about the beginning how does it begin how does it relate to the rest of their life before you start the experience how does it finish how does it relate to the rest of their life after this how do the episodes of learning and interaction connect across different traversals they say different devices different settings different mind spaces, whatever. Um, and like I was saying earlier, sorry, I'm going really close to the edge of my time. Uh, <coughs> the particular one that I'm interested in is, of course, Professor Wells Lucky, who was my supervisor, frame, which is learner-centred ecology of resources. Why am I interested in this? It's the Dotsian inspired and it puts the learner at the centre. It's the learner's perspective of learning. Why am I, why is this person learning? What in a world of resources? So, what is the target knowledge and skills that this person wants to learn? Why? Um, what are the what is the environment that they're learning in, and how does this structure their interactions, constrain their interactions, facilitate their interactions? Um, what are the tools and people that can help them beyond their independent competence move? in their zone of proximal development towards improved competence. So she talks about the, the filters that constrain these interactions with new resources and the designer's job to be to reconfigure the environment so that the interactions that are possible facilitate accessing help that will do help you do meaningful tasks. 
Okay, the problem with this is it's a two-dimensional diagram, and I think it loses something of her definition of context, which is important here, which is that um, context, in her definition, is not the setting that is static around you. It's created by each learner. My context stays with me, and it's what I create. So it's my perspective on the world that's important, not the world around me, if you like. It's local to a learner. Context is dynamic and changes as I learn and as I move through situations, but not because the outside context, because I change, I change my perspective, I learn stuff. And it's associated to connections between people, things, locations, and events. But this is the key thing. In a narrative that is driven by people's intentionality and motivations. So here we're getting to the narrative aspect of it. So technology can help me make these connections in some way. And people can help these connections become meaningful for me. So this and the time scale is the individual's life. Is how does this learning that I want to design relate to this individual's life, their motivations, their prior experiences and their future experiences. So the way I operationalize this is to go back to an interaction with design stuff. This can be operationalized in story, in writing, in telling narratives, which is a natural way for us to describe experiences, about the experiences we have had and the experiences we would like to have with technology. So using scenarios, if you like, but quite um, concrete scenarios, to help us make designs. We need to figure who, what are they going to learn, why are they going to learn this, where are they going to learn this, under what constraints, with what kind of help, who can help them, what more able partners are available, what tools can help them, um, and when, but not just when as one officer, but when in the narrative, in the learning trajectory, when in their lives does this experience or series of experience help? How can we grab and hold their attention and scaffold their performance through this learning trajectory? So this is what I use to frame my design. Okay, so I think I've just gone over my time. And that means I can't really talk about my lexicon as a pro. My lexicon as a pro means the app that I developed was not for release on the market. I'm not making claims about this app helping you learn language. What my app is doing is like a kind of double stimulus for what's going to experience. It is a pro. I give you this. It's fairly flexible. You can reconfigure it. And I ask you to learn vocabulary with it. And through you learning vocabulary with it, and these are data points of people using it, six people using it over between six weeks and six months, the vocabulary they look at, etc. You gain a vocabulary of experience of what mobile vocabulary learning can be like, through which you can contribute to a participatory design process. So my, my app is not attempting to solve mobile learning, it is a pro, a stimulus for participatory design. So my research got people, I developed an app that communicates part of my vision for mobile vocabulary learning. People used it for between six weeks and six months. And then we came together in a design workshop to create a vision for what a vocabulary app for them, for mobile vocabulary learning, should be like. So that's really the core of my thesis, if you like. And that's what one of the papers I'll present at the Oracle Hall is about this. That is a way of involving learners in designing their own learning, if you like. And that's what my other paper you're coming about is about, which is the actual research I'm doing with my teenage learners around them designing their own technology enhanced language learning experiences. Anyway, um, 42 minutes, sorry, a bit over. Seven more opportunities and challenges. Did anyone guess what I'm going to suggest these are? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can see I'm, I'm losing. <coughs> so, I think um, looking out, <coughs> And looking in is one of the areas. What do I mean by this? Okay, loads of people are talking about glass and wearing glass. Um, do you want to see a quick vision of someone's vision of what glass can do for language learning? Mm -hmm. Votes yes, vote no? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So we'll. Um, so, whoops. Okay. This is a guy. Hi, everyone. Greg Stetson here from Google Glass, giving you a heads up on what they are and how we're integrating a ton of Ethica apps into them for instant translation of what you see and language learning functions. Now, these are the first step to making an online experience in real life. You can make calls, send messages, take photos and videos, navigate, and now learn the language and more with the Ethica apps we're developing. With over 220 languages 
and 640 apps already on Google Play, Actica brings a new way of seeing a multicultural world through glass. As you walk through Piazza San Marco and Venice, taking in the sights, smells, and sounds, you'll also be able to translate anything you see just by looking at it. This part in front of your right eye is connected to a camera that registers any image. By saying, translate this to English class while sitting in Cafe Florian overlooking the Basilica with a menu in hand, Glass will instantly translate that entire menu using the Echo Machine Translation app. You can take a picture of the table next to you, say, add the word table to this picture, Glass, followed by, add this picture to my flashcards class, and it will automatically open up the Ectica flashcards application and put the picture in. Now you'll have the word table and the translation right there, so you can learn and remember words based on what you saw. Those pictures can then be added to the language teacher app by saying, add pictures to language teacher class. That particular application will use everything you've seen around the world to teach you an entire language step by step. Okay, so that's enough of him advertising his project. But I think that's a lot of what people are seeing in glass. Augmented reality, making it really easy to capture language and learn from your experience with his one app to rule them all. And I don't personally think that that's it, but it's part of what's coming. Um, what I was going to suggest is as interesting, or perhaps more interesting, is looking in, looking into people's eyes. And that's... <laughs> Controlling their apps on their tablets or on their mobile phones by moving their heads and looking. It's eye tracking on mobile devices, software only. There's a lot of commercial interest as well that's going to drive this. The next generation of tablets and mobiles, I would predict, will have more than one camera in front and they will be able to track gaze really well. You know, obviously, the Samsung ones are already tracked to some extent, the scrolling, etc. Why is that interesting for language learning? Because there's a lot of research around using eye tracking to detect when people are struggling with stuff they're reading. And then if you put that together with automated glossing, then you can be reading on your mobile device and it can be detecting what you're looking at. It can be enhancing that way in some way to enhance meaning for you or to promote noticing of language that it thinks you should be noticing, etc. So that's one thing that I think is an opportunity and a challenge. Um, putting together incidental and deliberate learning, connecting observations and capture of language when you're out and about on a holiday with more deliberate at home. Ah, what was that phrase that I didn't pick up? What was that thing that I noticed in the book the other day? So connecting incidental and deliberate learning, which I think is very much what Agnes's Masseltoff project is doing in some kind of senses. Um, connecting learner control and teacher controlled activity, sharing responsibility inside and outside the classroom, using mobile devices to let people personalize their learning experiences and make them relevant and meaningful to them within the classroom, and letting teachers look at what you're doing and advise you, so using open learning modeling, much like Susan Bull and Agnes's work, suggestions as well, um, sensitivity. Building adaptive and adaptable apps, by which, and this comes from my own research as well, by which I mean responding to, tracking what the users are doing, responding to what they're doing, increasing the difficulty, decreasing difficulty, scaffolding, but also letting the users determine where they want to be prompted, scaffolded, etc. So, mixed initiative, system, user. Um, I think interesting here are English profile, do you know English profile? Cambridge stuff. Okay, if you look at Michael, Michael Carrier's talk on IATF, well that's video recorded as well, English Profile has got all the, came, you know that Cambridge has masses of data about all the typical mistakes that Spanish speakers make in English, for example. So, English Monstrum, you know English Monstrum? Yeah. Yeah, again, around typical, okay, they've got all that data and they've got internationally that data and they have English Profile will let you look at 
vocabulary typically used at B1, B2, C. So for me, with my Cambridge Advanced classes, they can write and communicate adequately. But that's not going to get them past the exam. They need to be able to demonstrate a C1 level of vocabulary. This can do automated analysis of their text. And in theory, it doesn't do it here. It could be suggesting to them, you know, here are some C1 level vocab terms you could be using instead of these ones, etc. So this is what I mean by assessment and help. Not just saying that's rubbish or a bit of writing, but saying that's quite good, but this would be better. And pushing them forward. Okay. Right to improve is a kind of beta, Cambridge beta. So if you watch Michael Carrier's video, he explains it and then you can log in and get a password. So there you can copy and paste a text and it will put in green, yellow, red, different areas of your text and give you an assessment of whether it thinks you're B1, B2, uh, C1. The slightly disappointing thing is that I tried it before suggesting my students should try it, and I couldn't get past B2. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm challenged. I copied an article from The Guardian that got C1. But I'm, I'm, slightly, I'm slightly dubious about um, how it works at this stage. There's one called Road to Grammar. Do you know Road to Grammar? That's a web tool. You just paste a text in there. It will then analyze the vocabulary for you to some extent and will tell you B1 and B2. Anyway, towards giving people individual help towards Bending their language beyond their current content, content, but beyond their current content. And in relation to automatic speech recognition, Michael Harris' talk is about automatic speech recognition, really, and it points to where Cambridge are going. So they're already trying to do automatic text recognition and marking, and get you know probably put all the Cambridge examiners out of the job, do it online. He thinks that ASR is getting close enough to do it for speaking as well. <clears throat> look, at, look at this talk and think about that. If you can do it for writing, you can nearly do it for speaking. ASI is pretty good, I mean, for example, I noticed that in, my, my students love using Siri in the class. It's okay, you know, and they're entertained by trying to speak in their notes for their presentation or their writing instead of putting writing them in. Um, I think actually the Google one is slightly better. For, on the, I tried this on my iPad, it doesn't really work. If I say ship or sheep, Sometimes it gets it right, sometimes it's on Google it gets it right. That kind of thing is, you know, if I think about it as a teacher, if my students, instead of me saying, you know, you say it, can I tell you that if, the, if their phone is saying ship or sheep fairly accurately, or van or van, or whatever they are, it's a pretty useful tool to, to have in the classroom. What can I do for five minutes now? Oh, I know, we'll do a bit of minimum pairs practice or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and one, two, three, four, five, six, there's only one after this, grab and hold. I think we're quite good at grabbing attention, but if you're using people's mobile devices and personal devices, you need, you need to be able to grab their attention, as one of the people that I've been consulting with recently for a company to say, my app needs to be as engaging as draw something. So he's, he's trying to build an app for language learning, but he realizes that he's competing with Minecraft or whatever it is that's obsessive for this kid. So, we need to be able to really grab their attention. That's not that difficult. What's much more difficult is grabbing and holding attention for 50 minutes. Whoops, sorry, I can't remember, I probably lost my video some time. But anyway, holding attention over long spans of time. And I think the final one is um, open, not closed. I don't think we should be trying to create one app to rule the world and make a meet out of the English foreign language market. Our apps should be working well together to support language learners with, after all, what is their data and help them share that data about their learning across apps for looking words up, practicing, speaking, etc. And I think actually, if you look back to Anne Sophie paper in 1988 in System, pre UBICOM, you'll read a vision for what a kind of integrated app for vocabulary learning to support building a treasure trove, a personal treasure trove of vocabulary should be like. And if you then imagine that vision in the Ubicon world, you maybe come up with a much more distributed architecture, but you have <coughs> what I think is you know, what the country mobile assisted vocabulary learning should be like. Anyway, sorry for going on for so long. That is the end of it. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Any questions? Any questions? Before we wrap up?
Oh yeah, I just wanted to say those yeah, related topics. We already discussed some things before, but I think it's an extremely interesting presentation. A lot of resources and a lot of ideas to start to improve. So we have a lot of them in our program. We have to evolve a lot. Everything is changing so fast. It was very interesting. They got the glasses thing, and so yeah, technology changes so fast that we sometimes we don't have. The, the ability to adapt to all these new devices and all that. So that's also a challenge for, for people creating products because it's very it's extremely changing world, changing environment. So it's really tough to, to adapt to all these changes. I, I, would, I would say that it's much more important the connections that you make about this thing that I've randomly thrown out than anything else I was going to try and say. If anyone wants to look at my app, or look at how eye tracking works on an iPad, I'm happy to show you that. Perhaps if you leave us the kind of this presentation we're putting in the group, would you have a bibliography machine readable format? For example? Uh, not for example. selected, uh, no. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was gonna, I didn't have time, but I was gonna put this, you know, put a QR code on it and put it on Prezi for you. I, I, I would, on slideshare. I will do that, or stick it on slideshare and, post to Twitter with the TSLAD hashtag so that people can access it if you're interested. Because obviously, I was really just trying to spark off a few things that you might want to look at. So, Thank you very much.